Well, the man sitting to my left, obviously you know who he is. He is entering, this surprises me even to read it, his 10th season as chairman and principal owner of the Milwaukee Brewers. Brewers have qualified for the postseason twice during his tenure, and they are hoping to qualify for the postseason for a third time in 2014. The owner of the Milwaukee Brewers, Mark Atanasio. Thank you for the nice introduction. I will point out, uh, it's, it's hard to believe it's 10 years. We, I mentioned last night, for folks interested in numerology, that bought the team in 05. Three years later in 08, we made the playoffs. Three years after that in 2011, we made the playoffs. And it is three years after that. Here we go. Now, the, the less well-known fact is that every year we play in Boston, we make the playoffs. And this year? And this year, we uh, were the Red Sox opening day, uh, Friday, April 4th, I think. So. All right, there you go. Mark, let's start at the beginning. When did you first fall in love with baseball? Oh, fell in love with baseball when I was, I actually grew up in the Bronx. And uh, my earliest recollections, I don't know when I first fell in love with baseball, but the 1964 season for the Yankees, uh, I recall, and what I, to this day have a searing memory of was them losing to the Cardinals and uh, leaving the apartment, which I probably shouldn't have done at the age of six or whatever, and, and walking around the block crying in, uh, on Pelham Parkway in the Bronx because, you know, we had lost. And then we kind of got back home, fortunately, and, uh, and I thought, well, well, we'll win next year. And we were right about, to, that's when the Yankees, you know, got old all of a sudden, about to, about on the precipice of ushering in the Horace Clark era. <laughs> and so, uh, well, I think most folks who, you know, cheer for the Yankees had a different experience. My formative years with the Yankees were, you know, uh, the, the, the better players were Horace Clark, Tom Tresh, Roy White. Not taking anything away from those players. But it uh, wasn't exactly Mantle, Maris, Berra, you know. OK. Now, obviously, you go to Brown University, you go to Columbia Law School, and you go into money management and other aspects in that field. Why did you decide to buy a baseball team? Uh, well, it's, it's always been a, a passion, baseball. I was, uh, I was a really mediocre high school player. Medio that's probably even stretching it a little bit, <laughs> a JV player. And uh, now, now my cousins seem to recollect that when I was in law school that I, I said I wanted to buy a baseball team and that that was a goal. Uh, it wasn't, you know, by the, and by the way, if it was a goal, that was really a crazy goal, right? <laughs> um, but it, it's always been a, a passion of mine. I thought I would maybe have it, when I first got involved with the, the Brewers, I thought, well, gee, it'd be really neat to make a small investment in the commissioner's team, get known to the, uh, you know, the folks in the sport uh, over 20 years. And when I was ready to retire in my mid-60s, you know, maybe I could become a control owner of a team. Who knows? And uh, they then shifted to, uh, the commissioner and his family shifted to uh, doing a, a, sale, a full sale of the team. And, you know, one of the things they taught us, mentioned I was money manager and investment banker. So uh, when you bid on something that's a non-binding indication of interest, which is pretty much every sports team, if you want it, what you need to do is put out a high number. <laughs> if you put out a low number, they bounce you out of the process. And if the team ends up selling at that low number and you're out of the process, you, you, it's hard to go and say, well, gee, I would have paid that. There's a lot of that in sports. There's 122 sports teams, and there's probably 122,000 individuals who say, well, I would have paid that for that team. So I just put out a, I, I knew generally what number they wanted. A lot of folks were in the 150 to $180 million range at that time. So I said $200 million. And next thing you know, I'm in, and I see Bob Quinn and Rick Schlesinger sitting there, and they knew. Next thing I know, I'm in the finals with like three or four other bidders. And, and there you are. And so uh, at that point, I thought, uh, you know, I didn't, 
when are you ever going to get an opportunity to buy a Major League Baseball team? You know, nev probably never. So better, better get it done. Now, you spoke of your roots in New York. You've also lived in Los Angeles. Why Milwaukee? Was it just the one of 30 that was available? Uh, well, I actually, my, my, uh, my younger brother's uh, wife is from Milwaukee. So uh, I visited the community and was fond of it. And when I, when I scratched the surface, you know, more than just visiting, it's really a wonderful community. And so, uh, and you know, it was a brand new, I remember very distinctly when I went out for my on-site diligence, I walked into the, and, and by the way, Allen and Company, who ran that process, they know how to run a, a sale of a sports team process, right? So they walk you into the right field corner, and there's this enormous structure, which is Miller Park. And you look up and you think, gosh, could you really own this? I mean, what would be cooler than this, right? And so that was that, that the second I stepped into the right field corner, which at that point, for everybody who remembers Jeff Jenkins, had a big sign up that said, Jenkins Jungle. And uh, I, that, that was it. I was going to do everything I could to. Now, how did you learn that you were the winning bidder? So uh, they had a very uh, buttoned up process. So things probably a, a function both of uh, you know Allen and Company's process and Wendy Seelig, who ran the process, who lives in Arizona now, was also extremely disciplined. And they told me that uh, they'd call me by you know certainly by four or five o'clock West Coast time because they were having their board meeting and their vote. So I, I leave the office early and I go and I, I sit in my uh, study at home at like four o'clock. I'm I'm ready and you know. And, and there were a couple of other serious bidders. Five o'clock, <laughs> the phone doesn't ring. Six o'clock, the phone doesn't ring. So um, I was getting a little uncomfortable, and then I thought, you know, this, this may not be working out. The, I imagine they were talking to the other bidder. So I went downstairs. I have a, a, a small gym in my house, and I got on the treadmill and got rid of the anxiety. And in the course of getting rid of the anxiety, I, I was kind of preparing my concession speech because, again, it's the commissioner's team, and I had to be, I wanted to, you know, be gracious, of course. So I had my whole concession speech plan. I go back upstairs, I sit in my office, and it's 7 o'clock, and the phone still hasn't rung. <laughs> At least I have my speech ready now. So the, the phone finally rings, and it's uh, Mark, Steve Greenberg, and Allen and Company. Hi, Steve. And he said, and then there's just silence. And I think Wendy was on the phone, too. Wendy Seeley on the phone, complete silence. And I said, and, and he doesn't say anything, so I'm very uncomfortable. So I said, well, now I know uh, how the Miss America candidate feels. <laughs> and, uh, and then Steve, who like completely deadpan, right on cue, says to me, we're not going to have any tears, are we? <laughs> so yeah, I said, no, no, no tears. So he said, well, we have three questions to ask you. And, uh, I remember one of them was to bump the price a little bit. Uh, now this, you know, relative to uh, bidding process 101, the two, the two points of advice I can give everyone is indicate at a high level. And, and second, if, if you're down to this final call and they say we have a few questions for you, the answer is always yes. Will you bump the price? Yes. Will you, uh, I forgot, could you be, I, I don't remember the other two, I just remember the price. And, uh, and then, when I said, I think he may have put price last. And then he says, well, okay, you got it. I said, you know, I got it? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, you got it. You're going to be the new owner of the Milwaukee Brewers. And I let out this scream that you could hear, you know, throughout my house. And poor Steve <laughs> listened to all this. <laughs> but uh, I've never, you know, I think the only other time I can recall being that excited was when uh, uh, Carlos Gomez scored the winning run in the playoff round. And I kind of lost focus on what I was supposed to be doing as the owner, and I jumped over the wall and ran to home plate and jumped on him, which I still get teased about by the, the guys. But. OK, now, but getting to the part where now you're in baseball, and you're going through the daily ups and downs, what was that like to adjust to? Because it is unlike any other business, and the people who work for teams, the people who are in the game, it's the thing that I guess they love the most and hate the most, just the highs and lows. So the, the thing that I, I, I talk to the players uh, every year at this 
very start of spring training and uh, at, at before the last uh, road trip uh, series. And one of the things you talk about is the fact that I, I don't, there's no other, nothing else in, that I know of that you have to d do it, even working on Broadway, you know, 162 games in 180 days. You need to go, and, and with that amount of travel, so even if you're on Broadway six days a week, you're, you're kind of you know, in one spot. Traveling all over the country, it's an, it's an enormous grind with, with huge highs and, and lows. And the, the, the best thing and the worst thing is that there's a game the next day, right? So if, if you're playing poorly, there's, a, you know, there's hope the next day, but also there's the, the grind of that. Um, and it, it actually, you know, I had to draw my experience in the financial markets because, you know, we get a scorecard every day on, on the team, obviously, winning and losing. And we, in our, you know, on Wall Street, you know, the market's up, the market's down. If your portfolio is up, your portfolio is down. And if you look at any stock graph and it kind of goes like this, what you need is the, the trend. And so hopefully your trend is good in baseball. And so the, the first year, well, the first year was just a blur and awesome. And, Win or lose, you know, we'd be losing 12 to 2 and I'd be sitting there. And in fact, there was one day, it was, it was an early season where I was sitting, you know, in Miller Park and it started raining and they didn't expect it and so the roof, you know, wasn't closed. And I'm sitting there in the rain uh, for Cubs fans. I think we're losing 11 to 2 or something like that to the Cubs. And, you know, the players, I, I sit right next to the dugout and the players come out and, and they're, they're not, they're even closer than, they're, they're like where the stage is, the, the dais is here. And they never look at you, very rarely. A few guys, like Carlos Gomez will kind of look at you, but uh, he's, he's pretty amped up. But most of the guys won't look at you. It's like you're not there. So Jim Edmonds, who's a veteran, comes out to the on-deck circle, and he looks over, and he walks all the way over, and he leans over to me, and he says, what are you still doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, well, we're playing, you know. <laughs> it's, it's raining. <laughs> we're, he didn't say we're losing, but he <laughs> yeah. like looks at the scoreboard. So um, I learned how to moderate myself on the ups and downs. It's, it's very, very uh, hard to do. Cause, and, and folks who work for teams do it because they're, they're passionate uh, for the sport. The players are great at it. The players know... You know, they can turn within, you know, uh, you go into a losing clubhouse, as you have many times, and it's quiet, but, you know, 20 minutes, whatever, when it's done, they're in the uh, dining room, you know, or the cafeteria eating, and they're relaxed, and, you know, they've learned mentally how to turn that off, and, and, and all of us, you know, for 24 hours after a loss in the uh, front office grind our teeth uh, till the next, you know, pitch comes, the first pitch. Now, in 10 years as an owner, you've had one general manager, Doug Melvin, which is a little bit surprising. I don't know that there are many owners who could say that. I wonder, from day one to now, how has your relationship with him evolved? Well, um, I'd say it's kind of like a marriage. And uh, you know, you're a married man. I've been married 27 years. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as several of our presidents have told us, you have to work at a marriage. And, you know, you have to work at your relationship, uh, which is a very close working relationship with, with all of these emotional ups and downs. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt as from a business side, if you look at well-run companies, well-run companies don't turn over their lead people. You know, they, you know, Microsoft went from Gates to Balmer to the new guy over 30 years, you know. Um, so I had a predisposition to, you have a quality executive like we have in Doug to, and I saw Jack Zorinzik here, uh, it's also a lot of pride for us that you know, we incubated talent not only at the GM level but future GMs, that you want to cherish that you have that. And, uh, and, and you know, frankly, for the first, Doug probably wouldn't see it this way, but for the first five years, I feel like all I was doing was trying to take it in. And, not that I didn't offer an opinion now and then, um, but one opinion I remember my first season, and, and I was really green, but I'm watching uh, 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 us on uh, July 4th, and who is the guy who was the former garbage collector who was Joe, Joe, Joe what? Joe Winkle, it was Joe Winkle, sis. 
So we, we had, the, and I'm not trying to pick on any, but, but we had Joe, and, and it was a great story because he'd been a, a, literally a garbage collector the year before. And, um, and, and it was a feel-good story, and we we're mop, going to be a mop-up guy. And again, I'm new to the sport, so I didn't think mop-up meant, you know, tie game, full house in Miller Park, uh, July 4th, bases loaded for uh, Washington, Alfonso Soriano coming up, and we bring in Joe Winklesass. <laughs> so, and I don't do this anymore. Obviously. So I'm watching this, and I wasn't at the game. I was home. So I called Doug. He's in his suite. I said, Doug, we're bringing in Joe Winklesass to face Alfonso Soriano with the bases loaded. And just as he's about to say something, grand slam. <laughs> he just launches it. Right? <laughs> um, so, uh, well, it was a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the answer is the manager doesn't. You know, what's interesting is the GMs, uh, uh, GMs generally have a plan, and, and I know in, in Moneyball, uh, you see with, with Billy Bean how there's a lot of, uh, uh, at least if, if as represented, dialogue between the GM and, and the manager. Doug has an absolute plan for all of these guys, but he really, um, having been around baseball for so long, has, I think, learned that from, at least from his standpoint, Letting the managers work through some of this stuff is better than his. So he really actually goes down to the clubhouse. So that I think he may have told our manager, who was Ned Yost at that time, after the game, you know, that wasn't really what we were hiring Joe for. But, you know, we're a weaver used to, you know, used to uh, say if a guy's wearing a major league uniform, I'm going to put him out there. And so sometimes what the GMs have to do is they'll actually realize that if they, if they don't like the way a manager is using a player, you know, they, it's easier to just move the player, which I think we also saw in the Moneyball movie with, with uh, the A's. Now, over the years, there have been times where you have been hands-on, maybe more hands-on than most owners. And I'm curious, when do you know or when do you feel it's the proper time for you to exert more influence than you otherwise might? I don't know that you ever know when the right time is, you know, uh, and I, and I think, and I was saying last night to a couple of our colleagues, that I, as, I, as I've been in the sport now coming on 10 years, I, I worry sometimes that, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting too much bounded by convention now. A lot of that, whenever I, you know, would insert myself into a process a little bit, it was a function of two things. It, it was, it was uh, passion, and in some cases it was, you know, I was... Naive's maybe a tough word, but I was too inexperienced to know better, but it turned out to be the right move. And so now I worry that because I have, you know, experience to draw on and, and I'm more patient. I don't know if Doug would think I'm more patient, but I think I'm more patient. I don't insert myself uh, the way I might have before. So, um, you know, there were, you, d you don't really know, I, but you do, you know, the... Uh, one of the nice things you asked about uh, working with Doug, one of the things he told me from the very beginning, back to when he was with the Orioles working for Peter Angelos, that he feels like, you know, the owner is like a factory owner. If the factory owner wants to put a new machine in, or, you know, it's it's his business. How can you? Be? He can, the GM who's maybe running the factory can give you his thoughts. But if if it's if you want to do something, it's you know he's always. Uh, been supportive of that, or su certainly su whether he, and in most cases actually he's agreed with what I wanted to do, but but he's supportive of, of the of owner coming in and, and, you know, doing something. Now the last two years, the last two off seasons, you guys have signed a starting pitcher late. Obviously all teams work with a budget, and yet from the outside it appears, eh, the owner just decided he wanted the player. So can you talk first about Loesch? and then about Garza, and how those decisions came about, and how you made it work financially. Well, I, you know, I, back to, uh, we actually, teams do have a budget, and, uh, but we, in, in some sense, haven't. Back to 2009, uh, you know, we, we used to have very rigid budgets, and we, I think it was the 09 season, we ended up, and again, I don't, you know, it's entertaining, and everybody here loves loves baseball. But I don't want to be in any way. You know, it, it is so hard to be a major league player. I don't care if you throw one pitch, 
I'm totally respectful of it. But you know, that year, because we're fitting in a budget, we, you know, we had four average pitchers. And I remember uh, you know, Doug, uh, which was clever, he's very, you know, he's very, uh, he's got a good sense of humor. So that year he was telling uh, the media that, uh, well, four of a kind beats two aces. Well, we found out that year the four of a kind may beat two aces in poker, it does not beat two aces in baseball. And one of our guys gave up the most home runs in the league and it was uh, one of those years. So, uh, as I got, and this is with experience in the sport, I, I determined that it was more important to have players who were difference makers. I mean, you, you need depth, uh, but players who, you, you can, you're better off to use depth with, with young players and, and players who are difference makers. So um, in each case with, and, and so the budget was kind of there, but there's always, you know, we've run the team financially responsibly uh, for a while now, so that, you know, we, we can't, we can't always stretch the budget the way a large market team can, but we can stretch the budget to find a player, whether it's through trade or when we stretched the budget when we traded for, for Zach Greinke. Um, but, you know, it's, it gets more attention in terms of your budget when you sign a free agent. So, you know, there was this, uh, in my investment business, I, I focus on opportunity and uh, usually the best times to be a buyer in the markets is when there's either fear or nobody else is buying, or and usually they're connected. But, um, and so what happened with, with Kyle was, it was uh, the new CBA, you had this uh, rule about giving up a draft choice, and giving up the draft choice uh, quickly evolved in our sport, and, and somewhat to this day, though it's changing a little bit, from giving up a lottery ticket to like giving up your firstborn. You know, just GMs were not gonna give up that draft choice. Didn't matter. And we'd sit there and visit an analytics conference. You know, you can actually do some work and say, well, what are the odds of a number 17 pick, we had the 17 pick that year, making it to the big leagues? What are the odds of it, that pick being a six year big leaguer, which is about 5%. And what's the impact that gonna have on you? Now, now it's a little more nuanced because you, your, your, your farm system is currency for trades and things. If we didn't have a, a good farm system, we couldn't have traded for Zach Grinke. So it, it's not as binary as that, uh, which is some of the challenges with analytics, I think, uh, generally, when we, whether you look at them for baseball, you look at it for making an investment, uh, People want to get to a binary, you know, it, if, if it's this, then it's that, and it's usually more complicated. So we were also making a decision to not restock our farm system, which needed some restocking. So you, you look at that, and then you look at what kind of a, a discount you think you're getting off in a normal market. Um, Kyle Loesch would have commanded after being 16 and three. Um, and then the final overlay on that, and you ask, well, how did it come about, is I came down to uh, Arizona here. We did a tour of the Dodgers and White Sox stadium to see what a, uh, see what a you know, we're at Maryvale, which the best thing about Maryvale is that it's really quaint and it's really old school. And Ken's smiling because he's been to Maryvale. We'd invite everyone to come out to Maryvale. It, it, it's a throwback, <laughs> but not in the way that, you know, Wrigley Field is a throwback. It's, it, it's, you know, it's a, it needs some, some capital spending. So, so I was looking at the Dodgers ballpark, and, and you talk about passion, and, or I am in emotion. And our game, we played the White Sox that day, and our guys just got smoked. I mean, balls were rocky, you know. I thought they were gonna be dense in the wall in the spring, I mean, it was brutal. And I walked, I, I met with Doug, I said, Doug, I'm gonna have to go, we gotta get one of these pitchers. We just, we just can't go through a season like this because, you know, away from competing and, and trying to win, I, I think there's also, um, and everybody here, we all love the sport, and, and what's great about the sport is, you know, you, you, there's hope. And, you know, to, to spend a, a summer, and, and folks in Wisconsin look forward to spending their summers there's nothing nicer than spending a summer day at Miller Park, but if you know that there's just no chance 
you're going to win, or worst case, you're going to continue to see bad baseball. That is not okay with me. And I was very concerned about, I, I wasn't kidding myself to think, oh boy, we get Carl Loesch and it's going to change things, but I just had to bring the, the quality of the product we were giving to our fan base up. And, and you know, I, look, I, I, it's interesting because when, it, when the deal was first announced, everyone looked at it as a bad deal because we gave up the draft choice. And when you roll through, now folks are mostly writing about it like it was a good deal, which, which it was. We, and Kyle's great in any event. We, you know, also looking to build a clubhouse. So it's kind of a long inside baseball story, but that's how that okay, let's kind of evolved. Ours. So... So Matt was different. Matt, um, you know, we're, we're focusing on pitching in depth. And, and in between, you know, um, we've quietly done some things to, um, very quietly, to build our, uh, uh, our farm system in pitching. So last year we got a, a pitcher, it was a high school pitcher, Williams, I think, in the, um, you know, late in the number 40, number 50 with the pick we had. And he really projected higher. And... Our scouts and development people did a great job getting him in, and I think he's already considered one of our top five prospects. And then when we traded John Axford, we got Michael Blazek, who has a very you know live arm. Um, and this offseason, um, I have this Taiwanese pitcher Wang, who you know the, the, this kid just throw. You know, last year he threw, he just throws strikes. And he's 21 years old, and he's a very high ceiling. And we're going to try to figure out how to keep him on our you know roster this year that they haven't made any decisions on that but so you know with and then uh, just in terms of restocking the farm system we trade K-Rod we get a player Delmonico who's a lefty hitting third baseman from the Orioles and then we get K-Rod back so we're you know and, and again we're you know small market team or I call ourselves a mid-market team in the Midwest and but you know Doug and his group quietly get five guys in to the farm system in a very you know high caliber way and then we trade for Will Smith from the Royals, another pitcher. So I was looking at this and thinking, well, you know, how can we, uh, you know, how can we get better? And you know, Nesbolillo, who's Ryan Braun's agent, uh, and I were talking in California, and uh, actually was uh, at Ryan's wedding, and um, and he was talking about one of his players, uh, maybe could come into our. Uh, into our bullpen, and you know the price was high for us for how we were looking to construct our bullpen, and so it, it wasn't going to work. And so I started walking away, and and he said, uh, I said, well, anybody, anybody else? And I literally started walking away, and out of this side, it is my bad ears. I was telling Ken, he said, well, how about how about uh, Matt Garza? So I just, I go, I swivel around and I spin around. I say, well, how about Matt Garza? So, well, you know, and he told me, the, you know, generically the, what kind of situation Matt was looking for. Well, uh, Renicky's there. So I walk over, like, like to where the projector is, sit down at Ron's table. I said, Ron, how about Matt Garza? <laughs> uh, he goes, yeah. <laughs> so the next morning I called Doug and I said, well, how about Matt Garza? And, you know, it... it uh, a, a lot, you know, the first thing is, well, you know, isn't he too expensive? Because, uh, you know, what, some of what happens in this, and there's been a lot of commentary around the Urban Santana thing, I think um, uh, numbers get leaked around players, and sometimes they're accurate and sometimes they're not, but when they're not accurate, I think it dampens the market. So, you know, the numbers on Matt that were, some of them were, were, were $75, $80 million dollars which we, you know, the Milwaukee Brewers, it's very hard for us to do that for a pitcher, only because, you know, pitching is so, you, one, one pitch, it could hurt your arm and all that. So as we got into the conversation, which, which then went, so this was early December all the way through, um, it was a whole process. When we make a decision at the team on baseball, I think this is probably true for a lot of teams, but you know, I, I counted when we did the, uh, the, the Grinky trade, I think we had 14 or 16 people, probably everybody sitting in the front row here, worked on that in some way, including, by the way, Craig Council went out, you know, because you know, there was some rumors, can Segura play shortstop? He's really a second baseman. So when Craig Council goes out and comes back and says, he can play shortstop, which we now all know. But that's a pretty good, you know, point of view. Uh, we had analytics people, we had scouts, we had, you know, uh, 
and then the senior people. If 16 people part of it, likewise with Matt, we had, and I never counted to that extent, but we had a huge number of, it had to be 10 or 12 people at our group. You know, we went out and diligenced him, Ron. You know, one of the nice things about having Ron as a manager is he's got, and Doug as a general manager, both have uh, a lot of relationships with baseball because they're just, they're good guys. So we can get good information. And you know, the information that came back on, on Matt is that he was a good guy. You know, all the managers who he had pitched for liked having him. You know, we had, you know, uh, we had Madden at the Rays and we had Dale Swain who had worked for us and the Cubs and uh, somehow we got to the, the twins who were also looking at him, so that was a little tougher. But, you know, we were able to get, a, you know, a good picture. And, and it, it takes, it, you know, it took probably two months at that point, or, or upwards. So some of it was, um, some of it relative to timing and that was situational, how much time it took us to do the work. And then some of it, I think if you look at free agency uh, over the last several years, and again from an analytics standpoint, there are, there are better deals to be had. La the later you go into the free agent, the Rays have been you know, brilliant at this actually. You know, they do a bunch of January signs and, and they're all good signs. What, what you can't do with that is, you know, if, if you want a particular player, you know, if you have, and especially if it's a Mark, you know, Jack was here. Jack, Jack wasn't going to wait till uh, Robinson Cano was not going to go at a bargain basement price in January. So you can't do that. But if you say, look, I'm, you're willing to hang back and wait, and if you get nothing, you're okay. We really did, we really were comfortable with our pitching this year. We've got 20 major league, we've got 20 guys for 12 spots who have played well, have pitched well at the major league level. So, but he, you know, it changed, it changed the whole dynamic, we feel. Now, you mentioned Nez Bolello. He works for CAA. He is Braun's agent. He is Garza's agent. He's also Aoki's agent. And you guys, from what I can tell from the outside, are fairly friendly. So does that occasionally lead to deals like at Gar uh, Braun's wedding? But also in the uh, case of Ioki, that, how did that? That was, by the way, that was really unique. We were, that we, you never, you know, one of the things I feel is uh, the, the, the more you get out and connect and talk to people, the more, and maybe this is some of my, you know, background uh, more in, in banking. You know, you, you know, had I not been, you know, he actually had not called me on Matt. Right. You know, it just it came up in this conversation on a completely different player. Um, uh, so yeah, I think as you, you know, uh, you know, I have a good relationship with Scott Boris too, who's, uh, uh, you know, Kyle's agent, and through the course of talking to Scott, you know, that, you know, Scott told me, by the way, on, on Kyle, uh, I set a record, the prior record, I don't remember who the player was, the prior record was with John Mosliak and the Cardinals, he had to make like 19 phone calls to, to get him to say yes, and he made 31 or 33 phone calls to me. <laughs> We had 33 conversations on Kyle. <laughs> so uh, I think that defines persistence. Um, right. So it, yeah, I think that there's a, uh, you know, and, and, and Doug is a uh, you know, terrific relationship. I think we're, we're, I think we're a perceived as a user-friendly team, you know, from the agency, uh, from agent, agent side. One more question before we yeah. take questions. Sure, great. The broadcast <laughs> revenue challenge that you guys face, that most mid to low revenue teams face. Your deal is locked in, as far as I can tell, and yet it's going to be dwarfed by other deals. How do you make it work? Our deal's locked in until 2020. At that time, we, you know, uh, it was still a, we made a, a shorter term, quote, shorter term extension of eight years. Uh, uh, I wanted to do as short as we could. Fox wanted to do as long as, they, I think they, what did they want, 20 years? Something like that when we extended for eight, but um, you know wh whatever we had done uh, because we're you know it's Wisconsin against the world here. We've got you know Minnesota and Chicago and Illinois and Detroit. It's whatever we can sell in Wisconsin. Um, it's one of the reasons these CBA negotiations are so important and you know Commissioner Seelig and, and the negotiating team last time it was. Artie uh, Moreno and you know, Jerry Reinsdorf, or I think Jerry was the lead, but you know, you're, you're trying to vector to competitive balance. It, it's critical. And you know, we've had, notwithstanding this disparity in broadcast revenues, we've 
we've had terrific competitive balance. I think it's one of the reasons you have a full room here because it's, it's interesting that there's, you know, we, we calculate this year that 17 teams have their highest payrolls ever. And, you know, that includes, and I bothered to write this down, the, you know, us, the A's, the Rays, the Padres, uh, Baltimore, Colorado, um, you know, a lot of very, very few, the, the Dodgers are an outlier in Philadelphia, but Pittsburgh, um, so that's all, you know, working, and um, we need to figure out how to compete against that, that backdrop. It's, it's an increasing challenge, there's no doubt. Okay, questions? No questions. No, there's no. questions. Here we go. Um, so revenue sharing, uh, that's a, you know, a big point in baseball. Uh, if you can comment um, about your thoughts about the revenue sharing in baseball and maybe some changes you'd like to see implemented or if you like the system the way it is now. Well, I think the system always, you know, uh, the system has worked now, you know, uh, and I think by definition it's worked because you have, you know, labor peace. And, and you have to start with that because uh, this, the sport, is, is, this is the national pastime, right? So you need to have baseball games being played in the summer. Nobody wants to, you know, have a work stop. I, I think on either side, no, no matter however either side postures. You know, ball players want to play baseball and, and we want to, you know, we all want to, you know, it's, it's really fun, right? I can't imagine a summer without baseball. So, although I guess there was one once. Yeah. Um, so, but you need to do it and it needs to be calibrated in a way so that, you know, last year, and it wasn't us, so last year, the, the Pittsburgh story was a great story. I mean, that, that was, you know, you, you want that hope wherever it is, so you, you have to fine tune it. And, you know, like I'm saying in looking at statistics, I think sometimes some of the challenges, if you pick on any one point in the CBA, so what, what's coming up now is this draft choice thing. And there's some, you know, there's maybe some, unexpected circ uh, results out of, out of that plan. But the, the whole of the CBA as it was constructed, which not only included that, but included uh, you know, sandwich picks for uh, lower revenue teams uh, or smaller market teams as defined, you know, includes slotting and other allowance. As a whole, it works. So what I think we have to be you know, aware of in any negotiation, including on revenue sharing, it, you have a, it, it's really two negotiations. Right? You have the negotiation and revenue sharing among the teams, and you have the, the discussion with the players on how to, because I view that as revenue sharing too. We're right around 50, 52 percent of our uh, total revenues go in terms of player compensation. And, you know, it, it has to work. It has to work. Likewise, well, I've talked a lot about this, the small market teams here. Um, obviously, from our perspective, we want to be able to compete. I think the large market teams need to have the benefit of their bargain that they, you know, they run a, you know, they, they run a business and they, you know, they all, uh, for the most part, anyway, spend a lot of money in terms of delivering uh, quality product to their fans. And, and you know, there's a limit on how much they should be asked to give up. And, and those of us who receive the money need to be using it to put a competitive product on the field and not to put money in our pockets. So it, it's, it ends up being a, a multi-layered conversation. Hi, Mark. Uh, Mike Velsich, University of Chicago. Thanks for coming out. Um, I had a question for you about how you think about uh, the overall uh, brewer's business profitability and revenue, how that intersects with pr projections you have for your team to make the playoffs. And, you know, for instance, if you think that going into a year you might win, you know, 86 or 87 win games, but one or two players you sign can put you into a, you know, 90 win plus category and you feel pretty good about making the playoffs, how much might that uplift on the business side from additional revenue from making the playoffs uh, impact your ability to, um, you know, pay for a player that on the margin could, could get you into that category? Well, it impacts it a lot, but you can't project it. You know, last year we couldn't have projected all the injuries we have. The sport, in, in a sense, is somewhat seasonal the way a retail business is seasonal. Uh, retail business, you gotta do well at Christmas to have a good uh, selling season or a good year. And 
in baseball, if you have a tough start, you know, which, by the way, we had last year in May in the, the perfect storm of negative events. Not only do we have all the injuries, we only won six games in May. The last time we'd only won six games was in 1969 in a month when, in August, I believe, when the Milwaukee Brewers were the Seattle Pilots. And, and so what happens is when you have a, a, a month like that, all the air comes out of the balloon. And especially in a community like ours where we, more so than other uh, teams in our community, there's a lot of walk-ups for people who buy tickets, you know, same day. And so, you know, uh, any of our projections last year, which were, you know, we, and again, this is an analytics conference, so you know, Bob Quinn is sitting in the front row here. We had and 10 years of data looking backwards that we could have told you there's no way we would have only drawn 2.56 million fans last year, but we never would have projected those outlier assumptions. And, and so, uh, and, and so it's very hard to therefore project, but you, what, you, what you try to do is come up with a, a baseline, and, and you, you don't want to get into, you can move in a sport, in this sport, by the way, even for our team, we can be, we can be plus or minus $30 million if you factor everything in. And so if you can't absorb that, you shouldn't, and that's where you see teams running into trouble if they either can't, they, they budget in any way and they can't absorb it. Uh, oftentimes then you'll see, you know, uh, wholesale trades of players. Or where teams are just too nervous about it and they can't absorb it, where they, they're just very disciplined then in, in not increasing and in keeping to a budget. So you, you can't, uh, and then of course you have to, I think at least in our team, if we're, if we're in the hunt in, in the summer and there's a trade deadline, there is no budget. <laughs> we, that's like we've got CC. There, you know, that, that we, are, we are in it to win it, so. Hey, Mark. Um, I was in Milwaukee over um, the past summer in August, as you were alluding to, when the Brewers decided to give $10 ticket vouchers to each fan who came to the ballpark in August. Can you sort of discuss the decision-making process that you and your personnel had to make to uh, sort of implement that program for the fans? We'd actually, uh, and you know the business people are in the front row here, Rick Schlesinger, Bob Quinn, Teddy Werner. Tom Hecht is here who runs sponsorships from the business side, but he wasn't part of the decision. The other guys were. Um, it was such, our fans, you know, every, every owner says their fans are the best in baseball, and. Uh, I say it and I believe it, and, I, and they, our fans are just are awesome. And they kept coming out to games last year, you know, even with all the injuries, you know, even with the uh, six wins in a month. So we started a conversation about what we could do, uh, and I like to think outside the box on what we can, what we can do. Uh, my first year, uh, our last game of the season was actually on my birthday, as it turned out. So I thought I'd give the fans a birthday present for me, and I, I just gave out free tickets to a game uh, the next year, which uh, sometimes got some mixed reviews in the sport. It's not supposed to be giving away games worth of free tickets, but I wanted to do something different. So uh, we went around on things, um, and uh, you know, and then and then we had. Uh, situation where Ryan Braun got, you know, suspended. So it was, you know, uh, talk about a perfect storm after all that. So, so look, we just got to do something really different and it, there can't be, and, and so it was literally, um, you know, saying here's, here's a voucher, we appreciate that you all come out, you can do whatever you want with it. And then of course, you know, folks looked and said, well, what's the catch? There, well, there was no catch. So the, the night we gave out the vouchers, um, I had, I had a, and I didn't think about it like this. I had a, fan, a guy with like full of, you know, arm full of food saying, thanks for feeding my family. I had a woman come up to me with these two enormous drinks. <laughs> thanks for the drinks. Uh, people were buying tickets. People were buying T-shirts. Uh, the only thing that was, uh, the only people who weren't smiling is, is Bob and, and Joe Zidanek, who was our financial person. We had, we had folks from the front office giving out the vouchers, and it was like giving out $10 bills or 20 whatever, the vouchers ten dollars, like, and and they were not smiling as they were handing them out. But it it, it was a 
it was a, a group decision. Uh, and we do a lot of things collectively like that. Hey, let me jump in. You mentioned Braun. And the journalist in me, I can't help but I was I, I was thinking, God, we, <laughs> we got through the interview without Ryan. Um, all right. <laughs> but that's ago, good. Two years ago, the press conference at Maryvale, we all heard what Ryan said. And I am sure you had conversations with him in private in which he expressed similar thoughts. You're the owner of the team. You've made this monstrous investment in him. You've made him your guy. What was your reaction when you heard that essentially he had lied? Well, first I was just, you know, as, as everyone was, I was just forgetting about that. That's kind of the second wave is, oh, he lied to me. The first wave is I was just stunned that he had done that. Forget about that he had lied about it and had the press conference, just I, I was stunned he had, he had done it um, for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> and then it, it sank in. So uh, you know, I had him come over to my apartment in Milwaukee, and we had a private meeting for an hour and I expressed how I felt about that. Um, but once I did that, and you know, he committed to me that he was going to do everything he could to win back, you know, my trust, the trust of the, more importantly, the trust of the fans and the community. You know, you need, uh, when, you, when you own a, a, a baseball team is a public trust. And, and so, and, and so I ultimately need, need to, needed to do the right thing here. Uh, but the right thing, I felt, was to give him the opportunity to win back everyone's trust and, and also, from running, you know, the guy is a really good player, you know? And so uh, you could be, there was even an editorial in the local paper, well, run him out of town. Well, you know, uh, MVPs don't come through Milwaukee that often, so you, you can't just run someone out of town because I'm having a, you know, I'm going to be petulant about someone not telling me the truth. So we're, we're working through it, and, and I, you know, and... and you know he's you know in the uh, he's in the second inning of the game here as far as I'm concerned or third inning but he's he's done you know a lot of good things in the community since uh, you know he's come forth he made a terrible mistake at the age of 28 I'm not you know I I'm not making excuses for Ryan here but you know uh, people make bigger mistakes who are more you know who are more mature. So I and I and America is founded on giving folks a second chance, but but he needs to make the most of the second chance, and I, he knows that. Yeah. Uh, next question. Any more? Over here, it's Ray Petrus, uh, private practice, sports psych, and pain and injury. And I just want to make a comment, Mr. Antonazio. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was over at Maryville, so I've been to the quaint place. And he was standing there, and I had a chance to walk up to him and talk to him. And I, I just wanted to relay the information that I never felt more comfortable and more at ease with anybody than I did with him. So I, I think that's a, a boat for him and his team and his corporation. And I just and I have a question. I just wanted to say that because I thought that was just yeah. so amazing. And I still feel that to this day that it was just so comfortable. So thank you. Well, thank you. That's very nice to hear. Anybody else? In the back. Thank you. Somewhat of a delicate question about why you decided to buy a team and get in the baseball, your love of the game versus the P&L financial aspects. And I guess what triggers this question is that there was an article written over the fall uh, without naming the team and without naming the owner, um, I guess you as an owner, you get to keep in your market all of your ticket sales, your merchandise sales, all of the sponsorships, that sort of thing. But when it comes to things such as merchandising around the league, there is a big pool that you will share in. And from what I understand, this owner came out with the comment that, you know something, I am not in a primary market. I share in this great big merchandise pool. Why should I field a team with tens of millions of dollars of overhead 
when I have the ability to run this as a successful P&L operation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the fan base was in an uproar, and I'd just like to get your comments on that, please. Well, uh, let's just start by saying that your recitation of how it works is, is accurate. And, I mean, in terms of the, the, how the money flows, and one of the, the ways I got comfort, because it was a big investment, in fact, my, so, after I got done with all the euphoria, what I didn't say is my, my wife, uh, Debbie, came into the, the study and she kind of closed the door and she said, you're not going to lose all our money, are you? <laughs> 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 and uh, she's five foot four, but she can be pretty scary. Five foot four, 105 pounds, and she can be pretty scary. <laughs> so I said, well, no, hon, I'm not that, you know, I'm not, Sure, I don't, you know, I, that, that's not the idea. I got a lot of comfort, when, and, and the numbers would be different for us now because as we built up the business, it's, it skews lower, but when the team, you know, hadn't, uh, you know, we, Tom Hecht, who's in the front row, I had mentioned, has done a great job with sponsorships for us, and, um, you know, media has improved, and uh, Jill Aronoff, who I saw this morning, has done a great job on retail, so our, our numbers are now up. We were in the bottom, you know, 10% uh, of revenues at one point in the sport. We are, we are not at all there now. But when we were in the bottom quartile, let's call it, 40% of our revenues came from a shared revenue source, which would have been either revenue, when, when I first bought the team, whether, whether it was revenue sharing then or, you know, and that, if, if, if I believe if you buy a, a T-shirt from a, a team on MLB.com that's not yours. You know, everybody shares. You know, one thirtieth. So if there's so Tanaka is good for the Brewers. Yeah, Tanaka is good. Yes, Tanaka is good for baseball. Uh, Tanaka is good for the Yankees, and he's good for baseball. He's good yeah, if they sell Tanaka T-shirts. If, if something gets sold on MLB.com, it comes. So, um, so I felt that the investment was forty percent of the revenue is coming from a shared source. It was almost as much an investment in Major League Baseball as it was in the Milwaukee franchise. And, and I think to this day, for the bottom rung metrics, again, I, we've moved out of that bottom rung, but I, it, through the great job people have done here, but that, that's probably the case. Now, owners get to do what they want with their resources. And so, you know, for me, uh, I'm doing this for passion, I think it's probably evident in July 4th phone calls and sorry on our grand slams, but, um, but, uh, but you know, for others that may have a different motivation, I've continued to work in my money management business, I call it my day job, so that I can pour every penny that we make at the team and then some back into the, into the franchise, whether it's players, it's every year we've improved the, the ballpark, you know, I can't, I can't speak for other owners who, you know, run it differently. If you, the, the, the sport is healthy, and, you know, one of the great things with the wood, Commissioner Seelig has de built the sport, the sport is healthy so that, you know, you can, you can make a profit in baseball if you want to make a profit. Um, and that wasn't always true in baseball, uh, and it, it, varying points that wasn't true in other leagues, but it's true in baseball, and so... It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know which owner you're talking about, but um, looks like Ken does. <laughs> All right, that will wrap it up. <laughs> I want to thank Mark very much for coming out. Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you.